Today on Carib Nation, we're talking mental health in the Caribbean diaspora, especially as we're dealing with a global pandemic right now, where physical isolation is almost the only way to prevent this pandemic from spreading further. People are dealing with trauma, loneliness, fear, alone in their homes sometimes. Today we talk about the potential mental health crisis that could be looming, how to prevent mental illness, and if you're mentally ill, what are some resources or tools to heal? Stay tuned. Good day, my name is Abby Charles, and I am here on Carib Nation today to speak with Dr. Astral Webb, founder and president of Healthy Kinder International, about mental health in the Caribbean. Right now, especially with this pandemic, we know that mental health has the potential to become a crisis across our Caribbean islands and across the Caribbean diaspora globally. Are we talking about mental health? Are we finding the resources that we need to stay healthy or to heal? Dr. Webb, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your background in mental health and what you have been doing across the Caribbean and the diaspora to um, address mental health. So most of the work that we do in mental health is really targeted towards mental health prevention and wellness for preserving overall mental well-being. Um, as we worked with health disparate communities, we recognized that in to order to adequately address the social determinants of health, mm -hmm. it's really important for us to recognize that mental health issues also exist. Mm -hmm. So it we have found that it was helpful looking at mental health prevention in terms of education and raising awareness around mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So our work really began finding empowerment workshops and seminars to at least introduce individuals to mental health. Mm -hmm. As we progress throughout the time, we recognize that um, having the gold standard right now of mental health first aid certification training was actually more impactful for individuals. And part of it is because they would learn the signs and symptoms about the most common mental health challenges and really having the tools to equip them to better assist themselves as well as their family members. Mm -hmm. So we have um, provided this training in the Caribbean and across the diaspora in general. Um, so in addition to that, we have also raised awareness about mental health issues on many international plat platforms mm -hmm. for the diaspora. And um, this was a really important because we know in the Caribbean region, any mention of mental health is associated with significant stigma and discrimination. So can you tell me a little bit about some of the work you've been doing with mental health first aid um, in the Caribbean? Because I know you've been taking some of your programs to Trinidad and um, working with young people especially, but tell me a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So we provided a number of workshops as well, just introduction into mental health first aid, but our primary um, impactful programs that we provided in Trinidad and Tobago was specifically the Youth Mental Health First Aid Certification. So there we certified uh, roughly 260 individuals. Um, they were not only nationals of Trinidad and Tobago, but they were members of other Caribbean countries as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, with all of the trainings, we always have some form of evaluation post the training. And we had a hundred percent response that this is training that should have been mandated either professionally yeah. or should have been passed through any 
person who is working with a youth, right? Mm -hmm. So we recognize that increasing that knowledge base, especially for our nationals where stigma is so high, um, it was very impactful. Right. So in the Caribbean region, we had um, um, various audiences that we provided a training for, and that included the TET Defense Force, so their Family Support Services Division. Mm -hmm. We trained a number of teachers in the primary and secondary schools. Um, we also um, include had a number of individuals from the Ministry of Social Work and Development who attended the training, a couple of clinical psychologists, social workers, and um, we had a few educators from Tuta and Cipriani Labor College. They actually went through the training themselves as well. So we wanted to really empower our nationals of how to better equip themselves to work with the youth. Mm -hmm. We recognize that it is not easy for you to talk about mental health issues. Um, it is not an open conversation that we as adults have with them. And they are struggling. They just really don't know if they should say something because they will embarrass their family members. Or mm -hmm. they sometimes don't even know who's the right person to share that information with. Mm -hmm. So what we love about the youth mental health first aid training is that it is a non-clinical based approach and it is, you know, um, a training module that allows us to be culturally relevant to the youth themselves without judgment, without discriminating against them because their feelings are real, they are mm -hmm. genuine and we have to address it. Mm -hmm. And it is important for us to as adults to understand, we do not have to have all the answers, but we do need to understand how our non-judgmental attitudes can support a young person going through some of those challenges. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important for the entire diaspora as well, um, not only to deal with the youth issues, but we also eventually need to deal with the adults. Yeah. Um, because again, that education needs to translate across both fields mm -hmm. if we're truly going to be impactful. Mm -hmm. So those were just some of the wonderful aspects about the program and training, which allowed us to provide that training over two years. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say that <clears throat> having, you know, the, the program um, recognized as possible solution for the Caribbean region has been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, we have had discussions with the Minister of Health from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, hi, and we have exchanged, you know, conversation around the importance of highlighting youth mental health mm -hmm. in the island. So my hope is that, you know, we can also empower many of the other Caribbean countries that have had not had the opportunity to go through such a training. Mm -hmm. And in addition to the Caribbean islands, tell me a little bit about how that is occurring in the diaspora here in the U.S. Internationally, is mental health first aid also a program that's offered across the diaspora? Absolutely. So what we have done here is that we advertise whenever we have training programs, whether it's the youth or the adult version. Mm -hmm. um, and many of the nationals have enrolled in the program themselves. Mm -hmm. And what we have recognized is that many families who are here, the assumption is, yes, they are working here, they are living here. But to be separated from our cultures, right, and our norms and traditions, mm -hmm. um, it creates a certain amount of depression at times around holidays or you know, um, anxiety at times in terms of a loved one home becomes sick, or mm -hmm. if you have to, um, especially during COVID-19 now, right? Or you cannot readily get on a plane and, and return to take care of everyone. It creates a certain amount of anxiety and mental health challenges for our nationals. So just to have the tools and resources that were provided through the Mental Health First Aid Training allowed them to help their children or nieces and nephews back home in Trinidad who may be struggling, or even the children who are here themselves, because sometimes it's difficult to integrate if you're an 
a child of an immigrant family, yeah. right? And we see that, um, you know, the cultural norms are so different and so diverse that it's important for us to recognize that we, uh, sometimes our youth here in the diaspora are struggling. Recently, we saw this as well with our international students who were studying abroad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And many of them were stranded and still are stranded in some states here because they were unable to fly back home or mm -hmm. because the dorms closed suddenly because of the outbreak of COVID. So mm -hmm. these are individuals, sometimes we don't think about food security, you know, how are they making ends meet? They came here to study. Now this has put a form of a pause for them. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how do we make sure that they're mentally well to continue to pursue the educational goals that they have set their hearts upon coming here. Right, right, right. There's a lot of um, misperceptions related to mental health. Uh, you know, when you hear mental health, people think mental illness. But what I heard you mention was that prevention and wellness is a key part of mental health. Can you tell me a little bit about how we can spread that message and support people um, enhancing their mental wellness as well as addressing mental health or mental illness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, it's important to understand, first of all, when we talk about being mentally healthy, it means that we're able to have control over our emotions, our feelings, and we're able to express it um, appropriately. Right. In other words, it will not impact the way we perform our daily activities or our relationships with others. Um, and in terms of work and studying um, activities, we're still able to function and live a full, fulfilling lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But as we, we have are faced with mental health challenges, sometimes our feelings and our ideas. Um, become a little bit distorted in a way. Right. And so we have to recognize as a people that this is normal behavior. It is nothing for us to be judgmental about. In mm -hmm. fact, we should be able to share with each other because we are beings of nurture, right? Mm -hmm. So we never, we want to know that we accepted, we're cared for, that, you know, someone is paying attention to how we feel. But because we don't talk about it, that's not the norm, right? To share about your feelings of depression or anxiety, or if you have suicidal ideation, or for some individuals who are in domestic violence situations, mm -hmm. um, it is not easy for them to say that I am being abused, whether it's emotionally, physically, or verbally, mm -hmm. right? So we have to be able to um, start talking with one another and letting each other know, you know, this is the way that I feel and I'm concerned about your feelings or the things that you have expressed to me. So the conversation should go both ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I really encourage anyone who has gone through a mental disorder or challenge of, for their own personal well-being. Um, to actually share with others. Because sometimes those who are struggling most believe they're isolated and they're the only ones going through it, and they're not. I mean, this COVID-19 has showed us that globally, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. No one is separate and apart. However, because physically, we have to isolate. Mm -hmm. um, people believe that social distancing means social isolation, and that's not what it means, right? right? So to be able to share um, our feelings, our concerns, our anxieties, we need to be able to do that globally. As adults, if we do that, our kids are more readily, um, we're more readily ask questions as well. And unfortunately, they are struggling because you know, they have questions. Why is this little bug, you know, causing so much destruction and death? And why does daddy lose his job? Or mommy not able to go see her mother when she's sick in the hospital or visit in a nursing home? The kids have questions as well. Yeah. Why can't we have birthday parties when my friends come over anymore? Or family gatherings for holidays? Mm -hmm. So we need to also be able to talk to our young people 
about what's happening. We don't have to have all the answers, mm -hmm. but we need to be able to come boost with them. And I think for, you know, for us moving forward as a people, it is our ability to care for one another, to express that constant concern um, and, and, and share our observations with others that we know something is going on and we don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but I am available, right? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately with every mental health disorder, help is available and recovery is possible. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be the main message mm -hmm. that we share with them. So do you feel as though mental health first aid is one of those tools to help people, parents, family members, friends, better be able to have those conversations around mental wellness or mental health with young people? Absolutely, I do, because uh, Mental Health First Aid is a public education awareness program. So it's designed to empower every adult, whether, you know, whether they are caretakers or family members or co-workers, mm -hmm. um, professors in a university. I mean, we all come in contact with a young person. And you know, when I um, facilitate these training sessions, I really say when we look at youth, we're looking at Age, as young as age of eight, mm -hmm. all the way to the age of 26 when they're still in college, because mm -hmm. a lot of our young people have unresolved mental health issues from their childhood. And it's really important that they learn how to cope with those um, issues and how they move forward. Be they don't have to reverse it or solve it, but they have to be able to say, you know what? this is an underlying mental health issue that I have, but it will not define me. Mm -hmm. And so their ability to cope through um, tools, through self-help strategies, to, through support, supports and what support groups are available. That is actually very, um, all part of that process of recovery. So the mental health first aid is designed to raise that awareness and the biggest, um, I think, goal, target goal is to really reduce the stigma and discrimination mm -hmm. around mental health. Mm -hmm. And so when we learn to break down those barriers, not only are we able to self-empower ourselves to address our mental health challenges, but also to look at another person and see hurt mm -hmm. um, and offer the help that they need. Um, there's a slogan we use, Abby, that says, hurt people hurt people. Yeah. And the truth is, if you're hurting emotionally, you are going to translate, transfer that hurt onto other individuals as well. Mm -hmm. And this is what the problem that we see with, for example, domestic violence or the use of substances like alcohol and drugs right? They're really designed to um, mask the pain, the psychological pain that that individual okay. has. Yeah. So we need to know that's not the best way to cope. And we need to help people reprogram what are the better coping strategies. And they don't have to do it alone. That is the, um, I think, probably the, um, the most difficult part of that process for that person to accept. Uh, most people think they have to do this alone and they don't. Yeah. So as we're thinking about this, you know, mental health first aid especially, but just in general mental health access um, for individuals, I know, you know, globally as and I'm most connected to the U S and um, Trinidad and Traditionally, access to mental health resources and services has been limited for individuals. Um, people worried about the cost or worried about, um, you know, the stigma related to mental health. But I was recently on an on a online um, talk about mental health where we were reading poems from across the Caribbean that sparked, um, spoke about mental health you know, in the, in the writing. And one of the pieces that came out was that, you know, there are resources in the Caribbean 
there's tons of resources and to some extent some of them are undersubscribed and i wonder you know how do we encourage more people to utilize mental health services and what opportunities are there for us to expand access to resources like mental health first aid training absolutely so we have first of all we need to recognize in the united states it's a totally different healthcare system from what we have in the caribbean Very different. But let me address let me first address those here in the diaspora. Um, we have, most individuals have some form of insurance. And if they don't, usually um, the community health centers will offer services for those who may be uninsured. Maybe not now because, you know, the priority is COVID cases. Mm -hmm. However, um, they, most of them are offering the access to mental health services in a different way because SAMHSA has released a significant amount of grant funding and almost all of them have applied for this. Uh -huh. So this is a health disparity that um, we need to be able to understand. We have now access. Now, depending on the state that you're in, um, the services are more readily available than others. However, there are a lot of NGOs, um, nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations who have also received some of those funding grants. Mm -hmm. So they are providing mental health services as well. So that's definitely, you know, another available resource. Unfortunately, in the Caribbean region, most of the countries spend less than 5% of their total health care costs on mental health services. Mm -hmm. There are a couple that um, spend a little more depending on, you know, the number of services they have. But in general, it's less than 10% of their budget. But we know globally that one in five individuals struggle with mental health issues. So clearly, we, there is a need for greater mental health services to provide for all of our nationals on all the islands. Um, and so on, in, in the absence of the secured funding for mental health, we need to provide and empower individuals with as much information about their own mental health. Mm -hmm. So that is why the Mental Health First Aid Program is very important, that public education and awareness. And it is my firm belief that the more individuals who go through the training and are aware of the issues, the more we can advocate for the increased number of services that are so greatly in demand. Mm -hmm. And we can do this moving forward because honestly, right now in the midst of COVID, I believe that our incident rates are more like three and five. But if we do have in the future, <laughs> we're going to be looking at more at four out of five or five out of five individuals with some mental health challenge. Right. And that is our reality. So now is that time for our islands to figure out how do we provide as many resources? And unfortunately in the Caribbean, the NGOs and the small nonprofit organizations are the ones providing mental health care, mental health services, and really taking care of the needs of these individuals. And I believe that this is the time for the healthcare system to step up. Mm -hmm. um, so we can leverage together. Um, it shouldn't just be a burden alone on the mental health services. We can partner with social services because if we know that it's a social determinants of health issues that are linked to the mental well-being of an individual, then there is an opportunity there as well to um, extend collaborations across the border. So I believe in the Caribbean, this is the, the issue that we have, the lack of education, the lack of coordination of services. Um, we can do this cost effective. Everyone does not need a psychiatrist or, you know, or a, even a psychologist. They may just need a therapist or a counselor or just someone to talk to Mm -hmm. and you know encourage them in self-help strategies so you know we can figure out a way to do this more cost effectively and i do not want to um underplay that the fact that there are many countries that have 
programs and services because they do. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that most of the people can act that readily access those services, whether it's because of lack of transportation, whether they need to depend on a loved one to get them there for appointments. Um, and the mental health program, um, I think one of the challenges is the ex long wait times. Mm -hmm. So we have, even though they have services there, um, they may not be readily available across the entire country or entire island. So we have to be able to coordinate. I believe this is the opportunity to provide more fluidity of the um, services because now we have to do telehealth and telemedicine platforms. So I think the only barrier may be Wi-Fi connectivity or just getting individuals to use the services because they can be available, but without reducing the stigma and discrimination, um, we're not going to be able to do this. Yeah. And that's the same here and in the Caribbean, right? You might have services, but there's still stigma related yeah, to mental health. So, um, you know, I want to turn the lens over to COVID-19 and really focus there a little bit as we think about different populations that might be going through trauma right now. Um, you know, I read an article about the fact that we are heading, if not already, we are dealing with a significant global mental health crisis and it's only going to get potentially worse. Um, and as I think about you know, when you hear about veteran health, a big part of veterans who are out at war or who have been in war, the amount of trauma that they see can sometimes affect their mental health. And we are dealing with a pandemic where doctors and our nurses are on the front line. Many of them in this country, especially are Caribbean nationals in, in England and in Europe too what tips or what, what, what are we seeing among our healthcare professionals in the diaspora related to mental health? Um, and what, you know, what would you recommend for someone who is working on the front lines, uh, dealing with death, um, doesn't necessarily can't connect with their family as they want to because of fear of mm -hmm. potentially bringing home COVID-19, you know, what, what resources are there for individuals mm -hmm. who are dealing with that? We do recognize that our healthcare workers right now are really struggling with the mental health issues. Um, they are the first responders. They are the ones who are there every single day. They are tired, they are overworked, they are overburdened, and they are concerned about the lack of PPEs mm -hmm. and about the um, inability to be able to hug their family members for comfort to relieve themselves. Mm -hmm. um, many of them have been isolated from their loved ones for the entire duration of this pandemic since they've been working. Um, so it is very, very difficult. But I think we need to take a moment and recognize that our healthcare providers also need to have mental health services. They need mental coaching um, to understand that you're not the savior for all. It, it's just not gonna happen in this time. We're gonna lose some and we have to be okay with that. Sure. Not because it's a failure on their part to take care of it. Mm -hmm. it. It's just because the virus is doing so much destruction. There's a point at which we can't reverse it. So it is very difficult, um, especially if you're the doctor on call and it is your responsibility to come up with the right treatment plan for each individual, um, there's a certain amount of letdown that you feel for, towards your patients. Mm -hmm. For the nurses who called, called the family members of the patients to update them, you know, today they're eating and they're okay. And then tomorrow the call is they are turning for the worst. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of the family members are not able to say goodbye. So the nurses are filling that role of family on top of their normal duties. Right. Um, sometimes as soon as they leave one patient's room, they walk into another, um, another patient passes away. So it's, it's very traumatic for them at this time. And sometimes, you know, as healthcare providers, we kind of start questioning ourselves, is there something else that we can do? Mm -hmm. We have done the best. 
disappeared for a second, just so you know. But I did. But it was so good. But anyway, continue. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> many a times, um, our healthcare workers, you know, revisit: Is there something else that I could have done, or could have done better, or is there another um, strategy that I could have used? Uh, but I, th this is a form of guilt in a way um, that they really should not hold on to. So I really encourage healthcare workers, if they feel that way, release it and let it go. Mm -hmm. One patient who is, um, there's so many more patients that we can support because I believe that they do their best. They do everything right. They do everything by the book. They do everything by the protocols that are in place. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to understand, I may not get each one, but the next one that comes in is another opportunity right. to help another one and their family members through it. And it works similar to like PTSD, um, part of the flashbacks, the, the memories they have, you know, the lack of the ability to sleep because you've seen senseless dying and death. Um, you know, part of the therapy is helping them to understand there was nothing they could have necessarily done to reverse it. The question is, how do we move forward now? Um, yes, the, the memories will stay there. The trauma is there. But in terms of, um, we have to seek our mental resilience and understand that we have to be able to find a way to get through this yeah. and we can do it together um, my sister works in the united kingdom in the hospital there she is on the front line um, covers the icu and some of the wards with wow. covid mm -hmm. patients she does the training mm -hmm. um, to teach the young nurses and they are you know overwhelmed i ironically she actually went through the youth mental health first aid training with me um so she's using a lot of those strategies to actually help these young nurses who have just come out never seen a pandemic of any kind and they they don't know what to do so it's very um difficult and Within, within our healthcare workforce, um, we see a significant increase in suicide ideation. Yeah, yeah. So my plea is to any provider out there, if you feel that overwhelmed, you feel hopeless, you feel helpless, I really encourage you to reach out and let someone know mm -hmm. because you are doing the best that you can. This is our time as a team. We try to pick up the slack for another one who may need a mental health break. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what we will continue to see as we move forward um, as with this COVID, especially with the potential surgence of it. Yeah. Yeah. Again. So with COVID-19 as well, there are so many different pockets or groups who are dealing with this, uh, you know, new reality. Parents, caregivers at home who are parenting 24 seven, uh, persons on the front line working in the morgue, um, seniors who are extremely fearful that they don't know how their bodies will react if they get this disease. So they're super scared to step outside. Um, you know, what entrepreneurs, business owners, people who have no idea what the next step is, how they're going to make a dime um, as they're dealing with this epidemic, who've had to lay off staff as well. What recommendations would you have for persons who are just dealing with anxiety and the fear of the unknown? Absolutely. So first, I, I think that we need to be able to identify who can be our point of support as we're going through these challenges, right? As you said, there are multiple groups, there are multiple issues, but the challenge is the same. They're all mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So we need to identify who is a trusted individual that I can share my feelings or my thoughts about the anxiety and that I'm concerned about, you know, the fact that I'm not sleeping or I just don't know what tomorrow holds. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, I believe, a struggle for anybody leading in any, in any facet. So for example, 
the head of household, the parents who have to provide, you know, in terms of work and how do I put food on the table? Right. I still have to educate my kids. Some parents don't even have higher than a high school education. So sometimes the assignments are virtually impossible for them to explain to their children. Um, and, you know, they may not feel comfortable disclosing that, right? Mm -hmm. um, the amount of shame or embarrassment um, that they never finish school. Um, we have in leadership, small business owners who have to make that decision, which employees do I keep and which ones do I let go? How long can I stay in business? I'm applying for aid and I haven't gotten the check yet. How do I make sure that payroll is met? Mm -hmm. um, so in every leadership um, um, position, even in the workplace, when we get ready to let up, um, lift some of these restrictions and employees can go back to work, question is, what do we do? What, do we have enough big spaces? Can we, how many employees do we bring in, right? Um, how do we make sure we can sanitize and keep the place safe and socially distance everyone and, and yet still provide a feeling of you belong to something right without feeling so alienated so there are just a lot of concerns and um, um, around the mental health spectrum and if you do have a trusted individual you can confide in it's easier because that is the person who will encourage you to seek the professional help um, so for some people, it has to be a stepwise. And Abby, honestly, over the years, I think that we've seen the highest um, anxiety and suicide rates with amongst our professionals. And the reason is they're embarrassed. I'm supposed to be more educated. Um, you know, no one wants to talk about mental health. And it's not only impacting them, it's impacting their relationships and even their children. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't find a platform for us to um, share with each other that it's okay to be challenged with anxiety, with depression, um, but there are coping strategies that probably can work. And if you need to talk to someone and they're beyond my pay grade, then maybe we can share and identify some professionals who can help. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to be that village again. I think this is the time to do it. And um, it's not a pride or position or education. I mean, COVID has taught us that. It doesn't matter what your status is or educational level is. It has impacted everyone. Yeah, and we is. are truly in this together. Mm -hmm. So this is not the time for anyone to feel alone and isolated. It is the time for us to unite and learn how to communicate with one another in terms of if you have, if I have these feelings, what should I do, mm -hmm. right? Um, but again, the best source of this plea for someone who has absolutely no knowledge about mental health disease is through a public education program like Mental Health First Aid mm -hmm. or some form of intro into mental health so that, you know, the basics are identified and covered. Yeah. And it, it, it is self-empowering. But beyond that, um, all that you can do is continue to identify self-help strategies, things that work for you. When you feel so stressed and overwhelmed, um, is it music, arts, you know, dancing, you know, getting away and calling a family member, a loved one, texting, you know, um, you know, something to break away from that pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the best that we can do under these circumstances until we are freed of this virus that's impacting us. And then we can go out there and be a community. You know, sometimes people just need a hug. We have to be able to say, I'm sending a social distance hug. Because the reality is, the physical hug is not going to come for a while. Right. And that's the other thing. We need to accept this is going to be our new normal. Mm -hmm. um, we can't reverse it. It's not business as usual anymore. And the sooner we're able to grasp that, the more. And of course, that brings a lot of uncertainty and anxiety. But the message behind that is, I'm not in this by myself. Right. We're all in this together. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you could build strategies to cope as Correct. well. Um, so, you know, Astral, I, I can't end this conversation without asking for our young people who, or anyone who might be interested in 
getting involved in mental health. Um, how did you get involved in this work? And what tips would you have for a young person or anybody to follow this path, or at least to get involved in mental health first aid training? Absolutely. So with all of my clinical knowledge on chronic disease prevention, because that's really where my preventive work started, um, it was really important for me to make sure that patients had complete wellness. Mm -hmm. And um, taking care of your body alone, that's not, that's one third of the part of the process, right? Um, but we had to look at people's emotions and their thoughts, their ideas, their behaviors, um, which are all aspects of the mental health of someone. And, um, you know, there weren't a lot of programs, a lot of resources doing that. I'm the type of person that will rise to the challenge of find a gap in my industry in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that I've learned over the years that I once oversaw 3,000 federally qualified health centers and clinics to provide care for the most vulnerable individuals here in the United States. Um, and it is in that work, I realized the one service that was missing was the mental health piece. Mental health in itself, the um, it is a specialty care. So it is very expensive for small clinics and community health centers to maintain. So we saw such a significant gap, but with the Affordable Care Act, it was mandated that, you know, we had mental parity and that we could provide that equality for everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. Um, and that was a breakthrough for us. But even though the services were provided, patients still weren't seeking mental health services. And when you're dealing with hard to reach populations, just like the Caribbean, with a lot of stigma, taboo, mm -hmm. pride issues, mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to get someone to seek mental health um, support unless they understand that this is something that, uh, you know, a feeling or an idea that mean, is affecting my ability to work or my relationships with others. And so I need help. And the inability for most people to say, I need help, is probably what, you know, is the greatest barrier for most individuals seeking care. And then there are some um, because of access. You know, if you have to go in to see a mental health provider and you have no transport, that's an issue. If the lines, which are typically six months long, are there, the question is, how do you help that person in, in the interim? And of course, um, I'll just touch on the seniors because this is a significant problem for them, especially those who are in isolation. They may be living in rural communities or within a nursing care facility. Um, and the last thing that they, um, the staff may be thinking of is their mental health, what mental well-being. Um, if they are already diagnosed with a mental health challenge, then they're given their prescription medications and, and they work with them accordingly. But outside of that, most people look at seniors and think dementia, um, Alzheimer's, these issues are just normal parts of aging. Um, but sometimes um, the, these are also individuals who are significantly depressed. Um, they have lost their independence, can't be with their family members. Um, so we cannot ignore those feelings. Mm -hmm. And um, seniors don't present the same way we do. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have to pay attention to what they're not saying and their nonverbals. That's really the clue. And if they're giving away their favorite things, it's also a clue to us that they're giving up and they're resigning on life. So um, these are, you know, just some of the um, helpful strategies that we can use um, to mobilize mm -hmm. everyone and, and really encourage everyone to seek mental wellness. Mm -hmm. And you know, if they're if someone is interested in pursuing a career in mental health, yes, um, absolutely. So this is clearly going to be the discipline that uh, we are going to need a lot more: mm -hmm. doctors, nurses, social workers, clinicians, psychologists, community therapists, health workers. You know, I'm a community health worker advocate. Community <laughs> health workers. Mm -hmm. It's actually the perfect environment for them because those are the icebreakers, the ones who can communicate the message to the greater community that 
you know, mental health challenges are real. And it's okay to feel anxious and depressed in this time because we're all going through it. Our norms have changed forever, all right? And in many cases, the things we have lost are going to be irreplaceable. So the question is, how do we move forward? And our um, community health workers are the greatest advocates to help that individual, like literally take their hand and guide them through the process until they can get on to the mental health professionals, Mm -hmm. right? And some people, like I said, may not need that level of of support. Mm -hmm. Um, But what's important is that we identify, and I think it is an opportunity now for organizations like yourself to really reach out to the hospitals, and the health centers at this point, well, they're probably not going to respond at this very point, but in the near future. And, um, you know, form a partnership of how the community workers can be that outreach person, especially now we're doing contact tracing. I think there's going to be that opportunity mm-hmm. for them to be a resource. Um, and um, many community health workers, just like the ones here in DC, uh, they have been certified in both an adult mental health first aid, and it does make a difference in, within that community. Mm-hmm. Everyone is not going to trust technology. Everyone does not want a virtual doctor who they can't physically see and talk to. Um, so that's where our community health workers really step in to get them to trust the new form of medicine and the direction that we're going to go into healthcare. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. You know, what we're hearing and what we've heard tonight is that there are resources out there. Um, We've heard a lot about mental health first aid as one of those resources to support individuals as they are dealing with, um, you know, issues related to coping in, especially right now during COVID-19, but also to be a support to someone else, to be able to identify what are some of the most prevalent mental um, forms of mental illness so that you're not diagnosing, but you can connect someone to the resources and be that support uh, that they need or may need the most. Um, you, you know, we also heard a little bit astral from you about the fact that people can become trained as mental health first aid implementers. You don't have to have a doctorate or be a doctor or a nurse to become certified as a mental health first aid facilitator or trainer. So it's a great way to start edging into uh, mental health um, if it's a career that you're interested in pursuing or if it's just something that you want to see enhanced in your community. Um, Astral, thank you so much for this rich conversation. Uh, you've made me so much more aware about the fact that I have a lot of information to learn related to mental health and coping. And I'm looking forward to connecting to resources and connecting with you more to learn more about that. (sighs) I wish I could give you a hug. Usually if we were in studio. I think it's socially distant. Um, And Abby, I want to thank you and Carib Nation for allowing me to participate on this very important conversation. It is very timely, um, not only for that reason, but moving forward post-COVID, we are going to need mental health services all across the board. Mm -hmm. So thank you for covering this segment. Awesome. Of course, we had to. So this is Carib Nation. Um, Again, thank you all for listening and engaging. Um, I hope that, especially right now, if there's anything that you need to talk about, that you have someone who's your trusted person who you can talk to. And if not, that you find a hotline or a resource to connect with. We are all in this together, Astral said, really. And it may not look that way because we are distant physically, but really and truly now is the time to connect with someone else around mental health. So again, this is Carib Nation. We are one Caribbean, one culture, one nation, one people. Carib Nation.